Friends, welcome to this uh, time of online worship. We are First Presbyterian Church, delighted that you have uh, chosen to spend this time in worship uh, with us. Welcome. We are delighted that you are here. Um, during, uh, actually over the next uh, five weeks, we are taking the Matthew 25 Awareness Challenge. And uh, if you subscribe to our e-notices, uh, you will have received something that looks much like this. Um, if you um, are joining us and you aren't on that list but would like to be on that list, uh, please place a comment there uh, either on Facebook or on our website or on our YouTube channel, and we will make sure that you get a copy. So, But once again, welcome. Delighted that you're here. <laughs> Friends, let us worship the Lord together. The Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Come now. 
Friends, let us give our sin to God using the prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Holy God, you are the Lord our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And yet our trust in you is fragile, easily crushed by our bent toward indifference. The dismissal of your faithfulness as a result of our forgetfulness. Our trust is fragile, easily broken by the slightest pause. An answer to prayer not instantly given. A request for peace not immediately felt. Our trust is fragile, easily displaced by God's of our own making, the God of self-sufficiency, chased at any cost, the God of illusion, pursued in any form. Lord, have mercy on us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, receive this declaration of forgiveness. Beloved, Hear the good news. Jesus Christ came to stand in the breach, to reconcile us to God. We are forgiven and freed. Amen. Mr. Todd here. So I am throwing a party and it's gonna be amazing. I've been working really hard for weeks trying to get things ready. It's gonna be so fun. And I've called a lot of people to invite them, but no one answered their phone. So I had to leave a bunch of messages. And I wonder if anyone has called me back to say that they're coming. Maybe we can listen to my messages right now. Look at this. Maybe you've never seen one of these. This is our actual home phone that I brought with me today. Let's listen to the messages. Eight messages. Message one. Hi, Don. It's Heather. I won't be able to make it to the party. 
What a bummer. If I really invited all those people and everyone said no, it would be pretty terrible. Can you imagine if you threw a party and invited lots and lots of people and everyone said they couldn't come? Maybe that they didn't really want to come? Hmm. Well, today's Bible story is another parable. And that's kind of like what happened in the parable. Now, a parable is a story that was told to teach a lesson about God and God's kingdom. So, in this parable, a king invites people to a big party. But everyone who's invited says no. And they don't really have good reasons not to come. They just don't come. Hmm. We can understand how that king must have felt. It's kind of a bummer to care about other people and want them to join you and then not have them join you. The king did everything possible to make the party great and everyone said no. Well, you'll hear the whole story read in just a moment. Maybe the king kind of represents God. God has invited all of us to love him and to follow him. But some people say no. Or sometimes we who have put our faith in him don't give him our best. We say, I'll put my faith in you, but we don't allow God to change us. Hmm. I think this parable teaches that God wants us to follow him and to follow him with all of our heart. We're invited to join him in his wonderful celebration. We must not be too busy with other things. We must give God number one priority, top priority in our lives. If we miss out on following God and being a friend of Jesus, 
it would be like missing out on the best party ever. Well, let's pray and ask God to be with us as we seek to follow him always. Join me in a word of prayer. Dear God, you invite us to know you and love you and follow you. Help us always say yes to you every single day. Amen. A reading from Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14, parable of the wedding party. Jesus responded by speaking again in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding party for his son. He sent his servants to call those invited to the wedding party, but they didn't want to come. Again, he sent other servants and said to them, Tell those who have been invited, Look, the meal is all prepared. I butchered the oxen and fattened the cattle. Now everything is ready. Come to the wedding party. But they paid no attention and went away. Some to their fields, others to their businesses. The rest of them grabbed his servants and abused them and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his orders to his school to destroy those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his servants, The wedding party is prepared, but those who were invited weren't worthy. Therefore, go to the roads on the edge of the town and invite everyone you find to the wedding party. Then those servants went to the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding party was full of guests. Now when the king came in and saw the guests, he spotted a man who wasn't wearing wedding clothes. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? But he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Tie his hands and feet and throw him out into the farthest darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Many people are invited, but few people are chosen. What does Christianity look like when it gets it wrong. Let's take our time to give this question some thought. As we are thinking, I want to pose a more positive question. What does Christianity look like when it gets it right? Christianity has always been one generation away from extinction. It is both fragile and resilient. This pandemic has revealed the faith's fragility and resilience. Okay, back to our questions. Here is how I answered the first question. What Christianity looks like when we get it wrong. We get it wrong when we are hypocritical. We get it wrong when we are judgmental. We get it wrong when we prefer power more than justice. Jesus didn't like hypocrites. He had a nose for hypocrisy and can smell it a mile away. He uses the word hypocrites 12 times in Matthew's gospel. He calls out the religious leadership for making a show of generosity when in reality, they were stingy. He calls them out for making a show about being prayerful when they were more interested in having people see them commune with God in prayer than they're actually communing with God in prayer. And the same goes for fasting. Jesus calls the religious leadership out for making sure others know they were fasting rather than they're using their fast to reorient their lives to God. Hypocrisy is about as attractive in the 21st century as it was in the first century. Our faith has to be more than for show. It has to change lives 
so that we can participate with God in changing the world. You know, it's hard to call the Prince of Peace Lord and then look the other way when it comes to violence. The millennial generation gets a lot of attention. They are the folks born between 1981 and 1996. They now outnumber all other generations, including my own, the baby boomers, those folks born between 1946 and 1964. Many millennials have taken a pass on religion, as it were, at least on institutional religion. When asked about religious affiliation, they check that box that says none. Do you know why? Many studies have suggested that the religion they have experienced, and especially Christianity, comes off as being hyper judgmental. The Jesus they read about in Scripture is gracious and makes room for everyone. So how does so much of Christianity wind up on a different path? Christians trading justice for power is an old story that shows up in every generation. When we, as people of faith, go with might instead of right, we betray the faith. It's not a good look for Christians. So these are some of the ways that Christianity gets it wrong. It's my list, and I bet you have your list as well. But Christianity gets it right as well. And it's wonderful. Every time we say everyone is welcome and demonstrate it by pulling out a chair at the table and offering it with an open heart to the person others may not know what to make of, the person of color, the differently abled, the gay or lesbian person, the person battling addiction, the person living with mental illness, that's getting it right. Every time the church stands up and unequivocally affirms that in God's realm, there is no place for ideas as insidious as racism where one race is superior and others are inferior. That's getting it right. Every time the church becomes a community that celebrates the birth of a child, grieves the death of a loved one, anguishes over the loss of a relationship or a job, and does so together, that's getting it right. Every time the church does all that Matthew 25 stuff, the feeding the hungry and providing drink for the thirsty, inviting the stranger and clothing the naked, caring for the sick and visiting the prisoner, that's getting it right. Again, that's my list. Christianity can get it wrong. God help us. But Christianity can get it right. Praise the Lord. Today's lesson is another of Jesus' parables. It's the parable of the wedding feast and the image of God's realm as a great banquet is common in ancient Jewish and Christian literature. Theodore Wardlaw, the president of Austin Seminary in Texas, tells a story of when he was a young pastor in one of his earliest congregations. And the church had an early childhood learning center much like our First Presbyterian Church weekday school. 
Wardlaw's study was near the playground. And after recess, the teachers would line up their young charges and give them a rather stern lecture before re-entering the building. And the lecture was on behavior becoming of God's house. The teacher would point to the building and say, boys and girls, I know you've heard me say this many times but you cannot be reminded enough how to behave in God's house. Now, when you go inside these doors, there is to be no talking, no laughing, no giggling, no playing, no running, no tickling. According to Wardlaw, the teacher really liked to emphasize the no tickling. Apparently, the teacher was trying to list every behavior that might possibly upset God. And she went on, no chasing, no breaking line, no fighting, no slapping. One day, says Wardlaw, he walked out of his study into the hallway and one of the children was at the water fountain in the hall getting a drink of water. At the sight of the preacher, the child gasped and shrank away and said, I'm sorry. Obviously, this young child had learned that God's realm was serious business. And I would agree. It is serious business, but not when it comes to the rules we make that draw weird lines between who is in and who is out and who is worthy and who is unworthy and what makes for acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Rather, it's serious business when it comes to the love and the justice and the mercy of God that we see in Christ and seek to exhibit toward one another in the world. If someone were to ask you what God's realm is like, would you say, oh, it's serious business? Maybe. Or might you go with Jesus' image? It's a party. It's a wedding feast. It's a great banquet. Holocaust survivor, activist, and author Elie Wiesel has written that the celebration of life is more important than the morning of death. And these are his words. Wiesel writes, when a wedding procession encounters a funeral procession in the street, the mourners must halt so as to allow the wedding to proceed. Surely you know the respect we show our dead, but a wedding, a symbol of life, a symbol of renewal, a symbol of promise, takes precedence. The symbols for God's realm are all celebratory. Wedding receptions, banquets, holiday feasts, the bread of life, the cup of blessing. In his parable, Jesus is telling us that God is inviting us to a party. All the time. Forever. And it's a party unlike any other we have ever seen. Everyone is there. Rich and poor, black and white, straight and gay, the abled and the differently abled, red and blue, Republican and Democrat, urban and rural, the well and the sick. I mean, everyone is there. The divides are all gone. Were they ever as real as we made them out to be 
anyway. The parable of the wedding feast in Matthew's gospel is quirky. It shouldn't be read as an allegory. Otherwise, God as the king comes off as being touchy and mean. The most challenging part of the story is the guest who was bound and tossed out for being inappropriately attired. As a child, this meant I had to dress up for church. As a seminarian, I discovered that's not what this story is about at all. Author Fred Craddock has the best take on the guest who was kicked out. Even when the realm of God is like a party, there is a distinction between being invited to the party and being ready for the party. Craddock writes, Matthew knew how easily grace can melt into permissiveness. He knew that for those who presume upon grace, forgiveness does not fulfill righteousness, but negates it. Matthew is apparently addressing a church that has lost the distinction between accepting all persons and condoning all behavior. Here's my take. The guest who got the boot brought through the door with him an apparel that reeked of hypocrisy, judgmentalism, and a little too much of might makes right. The apparel should have had the aroma of gladness and thanksgiving. That's my read. Here's the good news in today's passage. God keeps issuing the invitation. And it arrives for us and for all daily. Will we say yes? And if we say yes, will we in fact be ready? And Jesus' story, some said yes, and some said no. And some said yes, and were ready. And some said yes, and weren't ready. And here's the challenge in today's passage. The kingdom is a party for all. Now that Jesus has given us this glimpse, what are we going to do about it? Amen. Friends, let us pray. Lord, we rejoice in you always. Even in times of trial and despite seasons of doubt and pain, we rejoice. We come to you pleading on behalf of the world that you love so much, asking for signs of your grace, interventions of your mercy, transformation that reflects your goodness. Lord, when we grow weary, send your spirit to encourage and uphold us. When we are tempted to give in to violence or force, remind us that we, your people, are to be known for our gentleness. Be near to us that we might know your peace. Grant us the strength of faith not to worry, but to instead think on things that are honorable. Help us to live lives with integrity, showing respect for your creation and love to our neighbors. May our actions reflect your character, the body of Christ, an extension of Jesus's earthly ministry until he comes again. Aid us in the work for inequity and our honest accounting of past wrongs and present oppression. Knowing that we are united in Christ and called to ministry of reconciliation, empower us to do the hard, tangible work of repairing the breach and restoring the streets. Reveal to us that which is pure, 
those things that speak of your holiness and point to your will. Do not let us be overtaken by cynicism or despair. Give us eyes to see you present and at work, ears to hear your voice however or through whoever you choose to speak, hearts inscribed with your word and moved to do your work. Teach us to recognize that which is pleasing in your sight so that we can name it, emulate it, expand it. In suffering so pervasive and varied in our world, we call forth hope and allow us to be bearers of it. Surround those bent over in grief and pain with disciplines who return and refuse to turn away. People committed to sitting in the darkness until dawn comes. Open our mouths to proclaim your praise. As our anxieties grow and our divisions increase, send the Holy Spirit to remind us of what Jesus taught us and remember that teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our giving is one way of saying thank you to God for what God has given to us. It's an act of gratitude. It is also an act of worship. But just as we present our words in liturgy, liturgy, song, and prayer to God, we present a portion of the fruit of our work to God, our money. May we reflect on what we have been given and respond by giving generously to the work of God through this community. Amen. Friends, receive this benediction. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand 
to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all children and the poor. Amen.